the Dead Sea Scrolls Deception by Michael Bygen and Richard Lay, authors of Holy Blood, Holy Grail. We have that book in our vast library. And we've read that one of them was a New Zealander involved with that project. Probably Michael Bygen. Why a handful of religious scholars conspired to suppress the revolutionary contents of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Yes, we did read about that. There was a Catholic priest said to do that sort of thing because the Roman Catholics, the Vatican was afraid that if a different story emerged, everybody would see that they were giving them false textual translations and so forth. We see in the dust jacket hidden for 19 centuries the Dead Sea Scrolls the earliest biblical manuscripts were found in caves near Jerusalem more than 40 years ago yet the content of a large part of the 800 ancient Hebrew and Aramaic manuscripts remains concealed from the general public in this remarkable book, Michael Bygen and Richard Lee, authors of the bestseller Holy Blood, Holy Grail, reveal new material that places the scrolls in the time of Jesus and offers nothing less than a new account of Christianity and an alternative and highly significant version of much of the New Testament. Working closely with Professor Robert Eisen Mann, one of the foremost experts in biblical archaeology and scholarship, and with other scholars in both American and Britain, Bygent and Lee set out to discover why the content of the scrolls was kept secret for so long. Their investigation began in Israel, led to the corridors of the Vatican and into the offices of the Inquisition. They encountered a rigidly held consensus on interpretation and dating and discovered just how fiercely orthodox biblical scholarship was prepared to fight to retain its monopoly on the materials and the interpretation. But the Dead Sea Scrolls deception is much more than an expose of a bitter struggle among scholars. Extensive interviews, historical analysis and a close study of both published and unpublished materials led Bygen and Lee to startling new views about the early Christians. For the scrolls identify the group known as Christians as a band of fervent theocratic revolutionaries intent on breaking Roman control of the Holy Land and restoring the Kingdom of Israel to its rightful Judaic dynasty of which Jesus himself was a member. The Dead Sea Scrolls have been used since their discovery and with the release of the scrolls themselves by the Huntington Library they are on front pages in prime time all over America at that, at that particular time. Right? This remarkable book tells the story of a great archaeological find and the mystery surrounding it. We're going to have a look at the back dust jacket to see if there's any information there. It doesn't indicate it. We can't see it. And it does say some of the text has been cut off. Okay. Uh, Michael Bygent graduated from Christchurch University, New Zealand. Richard Lee followed up his degree from Tufts University with postgraduate post studies at the University of Chicago and the State University of New York at Stony Brook. Together they wrote Holy Blood, Holy Grail, the Messianic Legacy in the Temple and the Lodge. It's a dedication, looks like it's in French. Contents. Even more content. Postscript. Notes and references. Bibliography and index. Acknowledgements. Preface. The four Dead Sea Scrolls. Biblical manuscripts dating back to at least 200 BC are for sale. This would be an ideal gift to an educational or religious institution by an individual group or group, Box F206. Such was the advertisement 
It appeared in the Wall Street Journal on 1st June 1954. Were an advertisement of this sort to appear today, it would no doubt be thought some species of practical joke, not entirely in the best of taste. Alternatively, it might be regarded as a coded message to mask an arms deal, for example, or something involving espionage. Today, of course, the Dead Sea Scrolls are well enough known, if only by name. Most people, while having an extremely nebulous idea of what they are, will at least have heard of them. If nothing else, there exists an awareness that the scrolls are in some way genuinely precious items, archaeological evidence of immense importance. One doesn't expect to find a specimen of them while digging in one's back garden. One doesn't regard them even as one white the rusted weapons, the domestic utensils and appliances, the remnants of equipment or apparel that might be found at, say, the site of some Roman excavation in Britain. The discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947 generated a flurry of excitement, both in scholarly circles and among the general public. But by 1954, their excitement had been skillfully diffused. The scrolls, it was assumed, had revealed everything they were going to reveal, and this was made to seem less dramatic than had been expected. In consequence, the advertisement for the sale elicited no particular public interest when it appeared on page 14 of the Wall Street Journal. Immediately below it was an advertisement for industrial steel tanks, electric welders and other equipment. In the adjacent column were lists of premises for rent, or premises for rent, and situations vacant. It was the equivalent of offering items of two tank commons, treasures, amidst lots of surplus plumbing or computer supplies. This book will show how such an anomaly could have occurred. In tracing the progress of DC scrolls from their discovery in the Judaizers to the various institutions that hold them today, these authors found themselves confronting a contradiction which they had faced before, the contradiction between the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith. The investigation began in Israel. It was to extend to the corridors of the Vatican and even more ominously into the offices of the Inquisition. They also encountered a rigidly maintained consensus of interpretation towards the content and dating of the scrolls and came to understand how explosive a non-partisan examination of them might be for the whole of Christian theological tradition. And they discovered how fiercely the world of orthodox biblical scholarship was prepared to fight to retain its monopoly or its stranglehold of available information. For Christians today, it is perfectly possible to acknowledge the Buddha, for example, or Muhammad, as historical individuals, just as one might Caesar or Alexander, or Alexander, and to differentiate them from the legends, the traditions, the, the theologies that have become associated with them. So far as Jesus is concerned, however, such differentiation, differentiation is altogether more difficult. At the very heart of Christian belief, history and theology are inextricably entangled. Each suffuses or suffuses the other, yet each, if looked at separately, is a potential threat to the other. It is therefore easier and safer to blur the demarcation lines between them. Thus, for the faithful, two quite distinct figures are fused into one. On the one hand, there is the historical individual, the man who, according to most scholars, actually existed and walked the sands of Palestine. 2,000 years ago. On the other hand, there is the man, God of Christian doctrine, the divine personage deified, extolled and promulgated by St. Paul. To examine this personage as an historical individual, to regard him, that is, as one might regard Muhammad or the Buddha, Caesar or Alexander, is still, for many Christians, tantamount to blasphemy. During the mid-1980s, these authors were engaged in precisely such blasphemy, in researching the project that had undertaken at the time, they were trying to separate history from theology to distinguish the historical Jesus from the Christ of faith. In the process, they blundered a head on into the muddle of contradictions that confronts all researchers into biblical material. And like all researchers before us, or before them, they found themselves bewildered by that muddle. In the kind of research that embarked on, scriptural accounts, needless to say, could provide only the most meager aid. Its historical documents and testimony, the Gospels, as every scholar knows, are notoriously unreliable. 
They are essentially accounts of stark mythic simplicity, seemingly occurring in an historical limbo. Jesus and his disciples appear centre stage of an extensively stylized tableau, from which most of the context has been stripped away. Romans and Jews mill confusingly in the background like extras on a film set. No sense is conveyed of the social, cultural, religious and political circumstances in which Jesus' drama is embedded. One is, in effect, confronted with an historical vacuum. The Acts of the Apostles fleshes out the picture only slightly. From the Acts, one derives at least a tenuous sense of milieu, of internecine strife and doctrinal squabbles amongst Jesus' immediate followers of a coalescing movement which will gradually, gradually take the form of Christianity, of a world that extends beyond the circumscribed confines of Galilee and Judea, of the geographical relation of Palestine to the rest of the Mediterranean. But there is still no accurate rendering of the broader social, cultural, religious and political forces at work. Everything is focused on and restricted to St. Paul. If the Gospels are stylized, the acts are no less, albeit in a different way. If the Gospels are reduced to the stark oversimplification of myth, the acts comprise a kind of picaresque novel. A picaresque novel, moreover, intended for, intended for specific propagandist purposes and with Paul as protagonist. There may be some insight into Paul's mentality, attitudes and adventures, but there is no reliable perspective on the world in which he moved. From the standpoint of any historian, any responsible chronicler, no account of the epoch would have been complete without some reference to Nero, say, and the burning of Rome. Even within Palestine, there were developments of momentous importance to those living at the time. In AD 39, for example, Herod Antipas, Tetrarch of Galilee, was exiled to the Pyrenees. By AD 41, both Galilee and Judea, administered by Roman procurators since AD 6, had been conferred on King Agrippa, and Palestine was united under a single non-Roman monarch, puppet though he might be, for the first time since the days of Herod the Great, nearly half a century before. None of these developments so much as mentioned in the Acts of the Apostles, the effect is akin to reading a biography of, say, Billy Graham, which makes no mention of his friendships with presidents and other prominent individuals, no mention of Kennedy's assassination, no mention of the civil rights movement, the war in Vietnam, the transformation of values during the 1960s, Watergate and its aftermath. Contrary to Christian tradition, Palestine 2,000 years ago was as real as any other historical setting. That of Cleopatra's Egypt, for example, or of Imperial Rome, both of which impinged upon it. Its reality cannot be reduced to a bald mythic simplicity. Whoever Jesus or Paul were, and whatever they did, must be placed against the backdrop of broader events, against the swirl of personalities, groups, institutions and movements that operated in first century Palestine and composed the fabric of what is called history. To obtain any real sense of this period, we, like every other researcher, had to turn to other sources, Roman accounts, historical chronicles, compiled by other writers of other orientations, allusions in later documents, apocryphal texts, the teachings and testimony of rival sects and creeds. Jesus himself was, needless to say, seldom mentioned in these sources, but they furnished a comprehensive and detailed picture of the world in which he moved. In fact, Jesus' world is better documented and chronicled than, for example, that of King Arthur or of Robin Hood. And if Jesus himself remains elusive, he is no more so than they. It was therefore with surprise and zest that these authors plunged into the background of the historical Jesus. But no sooner had they done so than when they found them themselves confronted by a problem that besets all researchers into biblical history. They found us themselves confronted by an apparently bewildering spectrum of Judaic cults, sects and subsects of political and religious organisations and institutions, which seemed sometimes to be militantly at odds with one another, sometimes to overlap. It quickly became apparent to us or them that that labels used to differentiate between these various groups, Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, Zealots, Nazarenes, were neither accurate nor useful. The muddle remained and Jesus seemed to have connections of one kind or another with virtually all its components. Thus, for example, insofar as anything could be established about him at all, 
He appeared to have come from a Pharisee family and background and to be steeped in Pharisaic thought. Several modern commentators have stressed the striking parallels between Jesus' teachings, especially the Sermon on the Mount, and those of Pharisee exponents such as the great Hillel. According to at least one commentator, Jesus was himself a Pharisee. But if Jesus' words were often interchangeable with those of official Pharisee doctrine at the time, they also appear to draw heavily on mystical or Essene thought. John the Baptist is generally recognised as having been an Essene of some sort, and his influence on Jesus introduces an obvious Essene element into the latter's career. According to scriptural accounts, however, John's mother, Jesus' maternal aunt Elizabeth, was married to a priest of the temple, thereby giving both men Sadducee connections. And most sensitive of all for a later Christian tradition, Jesus clearly seems to have included zealots among his followers. Simon Zelotes, Zelotes, for example, or Simon the Zealot, and possibly Judas Iscariot, whose name, as it comes down to us, may derive from the fierce Sicari. In itself, of course, the mere suggestion of association with the Zealots was highly provocative. Was Jesus indeed the meek lamb-like saviour of subsequent Christian tradition? Was he indeed wholly non-violent? Why then did he embark on violent actions, such as overturning the tables of the money changers in the temple? Why is he portrayed as being executed by the Romans in a fashion reserved exclusively for revolutionary activity? Why, before his vigil in Gethsemane, did he instruct his followers to equip themselves with swords? Why, shortly thereafter, did Peter actually draw a sword and lop off the ear of a minion in the high priest's entourage? And if Jesus was in fact more militant than generally depicted, was he not also, of necessity, more politically committed? How then could one explain his preparedness to give unto Caesar what was Caesar's, assuming that to be an accurate transcription and translation of his words? If such contradictions surround Jesus during, surrounded Jesus during his lifetime, they also appear to have survived him, continuing for at least another 40 odd years after his reported death in AD 74. The fortress of Masada, having withstood a sustained Roman siege, was at last overrun, but only when its defending garrisons committed mass suicide. The defenders of Masada are generally acknowledged to have been zealots, not a religious sect according to conventional interpretations, but adherents of a political and military movement. As it has been preserved for posterity, however, the doctrines of the garrisons defenders would appear to have been that of the Essenes, the allegedly non-violent, mystically oriented sect who were believed to have disowned all forms of political, not to say military, activity. Such were the contradictions and prevailing confusion we've, the authors found. But if they were flummoxed by all, so too were professional scholars, experts far more deeply versed in the material than these authors, than themselves. After threading a path through the maze, virtually every reliable commentator ended up at odds with his colleagues. According to some, Christianity arose as a quietus, a quietist, to Sean that word, looks like quietist, but it might be quietist, mystery school form of Judaism, which couldn't therefore have any connection with military or militant revolutionary nationalists, such as the Zealots. According to others, Christianity was itself at first a form of revolutionary Judaic nationalism and couldn't possibly have anything to do with pacifist mystics like the Essenes. According to some, Christianity emerged from one of the mainstreams of Judaic thought at the time. According to others, Christianity had begun to deviate from Judaism even before Paul appeared on the scene and made the rupture official. The more we can, or more they consulted the experts, the more apparent it became that they knew, effectively, little more than anyone else. Most disturbing of all, these authors encountered no one theory or interpretation that satisfactorily accommodated all the evidence, all the anonym, anomalies, inconsistencies, and contradictions. It was at this point that they came upon the work of Robert Eisenman, chairman of the Department of Religious Studies and Professor of Middle East Religions at California State University in Long Beach, 
Eisenman had been an undergraduate at Cornell at the same time as Thomas Pynchon. He studied comparative literature there under Vladimir Nabokov, receiving his BA in Physics and Philosophy in 1958, and his MA, maybe it's his Master's, in Hebrew and Near Eastern Studies from New York University in 1966. In 1971, he was awarded a PhD in Middle East Languages and Cultures by Columbia University, having concentrated specifically on Palestinian history and Islamic law. He has also been an external fellow of the University of Calabria in Italy and so forth, so forth. More information on him. They, they came upon Eisman's work initially in the form of the slender text cumbrously entitled Maccabees, Zadokites, Christians and Qumran, which was published in 1983 by E.J. Brill of Leiden, Holland. The book was precisely the sort of thing one might expect from such an author writing for an academic academic publisher. There were more footnotes than there was text. There was a presupposition of enormous background knowledge and a forbidding welter of sources and references. But there was also a central thesis of exhilarating common sense and lucidity. As the authors hacked their way through the density of the text, the questions that had perplexed them began to resolve themselves, clearly and organically, without ingeniously contrived theories and without crucial fragments being ignored. The authors drew extensively on Eisenman's work in the first section of the Messianic Le Legacy, London 1986. Their conclusions owed much to the perspective he had opened for them on biblical scholarship and the historical background to the New Testament. However, certain questions remained unanswered. The authors could not have known it at the time, that, but they had overlooked a crucial link, a link that has, over the last five years, become a focus for controversy, a topic for front-page articles in national newspapers. That link proved to be the information provided by the Dead Sea Scrolls. At the centre of the puzzle, they discovered they were to discover was a hitherto unknown connection between the Dead Sea Scrolls and the elusive figure of St. James, Jesus' brother, whose dispute with Paul precipitated the formulation of the new religion, subsequently known as Christianity. It was this link that had been painstakingly concealed by a small enclave of biblical scholars whose conveniently orthodox interpretations of the scrolls Ice and Man came to call the consensus. According to Robert Eisenman, a small group of specialists largely working together developed a consensus in lieu of clear historical insight, preconceptions and reconstructions, such as they were, were stated as facts and these results, which were used to corroborate each other, in turn became new assumption that were used to draw away a whole generation of students unwillingly unwilling or simply unable to question the work of their mentors. The result has been the upholding of an official orthodoxy of interpretation, a framework of assumptions and conclusions which, to outsiders, appears to have the solid solidity of established and undisputed fact. In this fashion, many of the so-called dones, the givens of the history, were produ produced. Those responsible for developing a consensus of New York Christianity have been able to exercise a monopoly or stranglehold over certain crucial sources, regulating the flow of information in a manner that enables its release to serve one's own purpose. This is a phenomenon explored by Umberto Eco in the name of the Rose, where the monastery and the library within it reflect the medieval church's monopoly of learning, constituting a kind of closed shop, an exclusive country club of knowledge from which all but a select few are banned, a select few prepared to tow the party line. Those purveying the party line can bolster the authority they arrogate to themselves by claiming that they alone have seen the relevant sources, access to which is closed to all outsiders. For outsiders, assembling this disparate, disparate, available fragments into a coherent order amounts to an exercise in semiotics and in the realm of semiotic exercises it becomes perfectly possible to hold the Knights Templar responsible for everything and Umberto Eco himself responsible for the collapse of the Banco Ambrosiano thus most outsiders in the absence of any access to the relevant sources 
have no choice but to accept the interpretations of the quote, party line, unquote. To challenge those interpretations is to find oneself labelled at best a crank, at worst a renegade, apostate or heretic. Few scholars have the combination of courage, standing in, standing in expertise to issue such a challenge and hold on to their reputations. Robert Eisenman, whose currency and credibility have placed him among the most prominent and influential figures in his field, has done so. His story provided the impetus for this book. Yeah, so someone who's got a strangle hold on all those all the information, probably through the uh, Roman Catholic Church, the, the Vatican. Yeah. It's trying to suppress the information in it in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So the public won't know. We never know, right? You just have to believe what they say. We've looked at it and that's it. The deception. The discovery of the scrolls. East of Jerusalem, a long road slopes gradually down between barren hills sprinkled with occasional Bedouin camps. It sinks 3,800 feet to a depth of 1,300 feet below sea level and then emerges to give a panoramic vista of the Jordan Valley. Away to the left, one can discern Jericho in the haze ahead like Jordan itself and as though seen in a mirage of mountains of Moab and so forth. It's on about the ruins of Kumana. and other areas around it. In 1947, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, Kumaran was very really different. At that time, the area was part of the British Mandate of Palestine. To the east lay what was then the Kingdom of Transjordan. The road that runs south along the shore of the Dead Sea did not exist, extending only to the Dead Sea's north and west northwestern quarter, a few miles from Jericho. Around and beyond it was with only rough tracks, one of which followed the course of an ancient Roman road. This route had long been in total disrepair. Qumran was thus rather more difficult to reach than it is today. The sole human presence in the vicinity would have been the Bedouin, herding the camels and goats during the winter and spring when the desert, perhaps surprisingly, yielded both water and grass. In the winter, or possibly the early spring of 1947, it was to yield something more one of the two or three greatest archaeological discoveries of modern times. The precise circumstances attending the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls have already passed into legend. In a number of particulars, this legend is probably not entirely accurate, and scholars were bickering over certain points well into the 1960s. It remains, however, the only account we have. The original discovery is ascribed to a shepherd boy, Muhammad Ad Dib or Muhammad the Wolf, a member of the Ta'amere tribe of Bedouin. He himself later claimed he was searching for a lost goat. Whatever he was doing, his itinerary brought him clambering among the cliffs at Qumran, where he discovered an opening in the cliff face. He tried to peer inside, but from where he stood, could see nothing. He then tossed a stone into the blackness, which elicited a sound of breaking pottery. Thus, with this, needless to say, impelled him to further exploration. Hoisting himself upward, he crawled through the aperture, then down, dropped down to find himself in a small cave, high ceiling, high ceiling and narrow, no more than six feet wide and perhaps twenty-four long. It contained a number of large earthenware jars, about two feet tall and ten inches wide, many of them broken. Eight are generally believed to have been intact, though the quantity has never been definitively established. According to his own account, Muhammad became frightened, hauled himself back out of the cave and fled. The next day he returned with at least one friend and proceeded to explore the cave and its, content more, its contents more closely. Some of the earthenware jars were sealed by large bowl-like lids. Inside one of them there were the three leather scroll rolls wrapped in decaying linen, the first of the Dead Sea Scrolls to see the light nearly 2,000 years. During the days that followed, the Bedouin returned to the site and at least four more leather rolls were found. At least two jars were removed and used for carrying water. When proper archaeological excavations began, it revealed a substantial number of sherds and fragments, enough, according to reliable estimates, to have constituted no fewer than 40 jars. There is no way of knowing how many of these jars were first discovered, were empty, 
and how many actually contain scrolls. Neither is there any way of knowing how many scrolls were taken from the cave and before their significance became apparent. Secreted away, destroyed or used for other purposes. Some, it has been suggested, were burned for fuel. In any case, we were told, or they were told, that more scrolls were taken from the cave than have previously been recorded, or than have subsequently come to light. Altogether, a total of seven complete scrolls were to find their way into the public domain, along with fragments and some 21 others. At this point, accounts begin to grow increasingly contradictory. Apparently, however, thinking the scrolls might be of some value, three Bedouins took all they had found, three complete parchments according to some sources, seven or eight according to others, to a local sheikh. He passed the Bedouin on to a Christian shopkeeper and dealer in curios and antiques, one Kali Iskander Shahin, known as Kandal. Kandal, a member of the Syrian Jacobite Church, maybe it's a church of the East, contacted another church member residing in Jerusalem, George Isaiah. According to reliable scholars, Kando and Isaiah probably ventured out to Qumran themselves and removed a number of additional scrolls and or fragments. Such activities were, of course, illegal. By the law of the British Mandate, a law subsequently retained by both Jordanian and Israeli governments, all archaeological discoveries belonged officially to the state. They were supposed to be turned over to the Department of Antiquities, then housed in the Palestine Archaeological Museum, known as Rockefeller in the Arab East Jerusalem. But Palestine was in turmoil at the time, and Jerusalem, a city divided into Jewish, Arab and British sectors. In these circumstances, the authorities had more pressing matters to deal with than a black market in archaeological relics. In consequence, Kando and George Isaiah were free to pursue their clandestine transactions with impunity. George Isaiah reported at the discovery to his ecclesiastical leader, the Syrian Metropolitan, i.e. Archbishop, Athanasius Yeshua Samuel, a head of, head of the Syrian Jacobite Church in Jerusalem. Academically, Athanasius Yeshua Samuel was a naive man, untutored in the sophisticated scholarship needed to identify, much less translate the text before him. The late Edmund Wilson, one of the earliest and most reliable commentators on the Qumran discovery, wrote of Samuel that he was not a Hebrew scholar and could not make out what the manuscript was. He even burned a small piece of it and smelled it to verify that the substance was indeed leather or parchment. But whatever his academic shortcomings, Samuel was also shrewd, and his monastery, St. Mark's, contained a famous collection of ancient documents. He thus had some idea of the importance of what he had passed in, of what had passed into his hands. Samuel later said he first learned of the Dead Sea Scrolls in April 1945. If chronology has hitherto been vague and contradictory, however, it now becomes even more so, varying from commentator to commentator. But sometime between early June and early July, Samuel requested Kando and George Isaiah to arrange a meeting with the three Bedouin who had made the original discovery to examine what they'd found, and so forth. Miles Copeland, who had joined the OSS during the Second World War, had remained with some organisation when it became the CIA and went on to become a long-serving operative and station chief. In a personal interview, Copeland told how in the autumn of 1947, he had just been posted to Damascus as the CIA's representative there. In the circumstances then prevailing, there was no need to operate under particularly deep cover, and his identity seems to have been pretty much an open secret. According to Copeland, a sly Egyptian merchant came to see him one day and claimed to possess a great treasure. Reaching into a dirty sack, the man then pulled out a scroll, the edges of which were already disintegrating. Fragments were flaking off into the street. When asked what it was, Copeland, of course, couldn't say. If the merchant had, if the merchant left it with him, however, he promised he would photograph it and get someone to study it. In order to photograph it, Copeland and his colleagues took the scroll up onto the roof of the American League in Damascus and stretched it up. A strong wind was gusting at the time. Copeland remembered and pieces of the scroll peeled away, wafted over the roof and into the streets of the city to be lost forever. According to Copeland, a substantial portion of the parchment vanished 
in this manner. Copeland's wife, an archaeologist herself, said she could not help wincing every time she heard the story. And then they used photographic equip equipment supplied by the American government. He reported some 30 frames. Uh, more information. And he came across this guy called Sukunik. Professor Eliezer Sukunik, the head of Hebrew University's Department of Archaeology. A secret meeting occurred between him and a figure subsequently identified only as an Armenian antique dealer. Neither had had time to obtain the requisite military passes. Requisite military passes. They were therefore obliged to meet at a checkpoint between the Jewish and the Arab zones of Jerusalem and to talk over across the barrier of barbed wire. Across this barrier, the Armenian showed Sukunik a fragment of a scroll on which Hebrew writing could be discerned. The Armenian then explained that an Arab antique dealer from Bethlehem had come to him the day before, bringing this other, this and other fragments alleged to have been found by a Bedouin. Sukunik was asked if they were genuine and if Hebrew University were prepared to purchase them. Sukunik requested a second meeting, which occurred three days later. This time he had a pass and was able to look closely at a number of fragments. Convinced they were important, he resolved to go to Bethlehem to see more. Dangerous though such an undertaking was at the time. Yarden also, for Yarden also the discovery of these scrolls was to assume an almost mystical significance as somebody else coming on the scene to uh, maybe it's Sukhanu he states he, he states he he couldn't avoid the feeling that there was something symbolic in the discovery of the scrolls and the acquisition at the moment of the creation of the state of Israel. It is as if these manuscripts had been waiting in caves for two thousand years, ever since the destruction of Israel's independence, until the people of Israel had returned to the home and regained their freedom. It's quite amazing. sitting there all that time. Israel becomes a state, 1947-1948, and then these scrolls are discovered. Sukunik's conviction of the importance of the discovery and seeking the seal of approval on the Qumran text, he also unwittingly provided support for those intent on attributing, attributing to the scrolls the earliest date possible. He states here, his heartiest congratulations, congratulations on the greatest manuscript discovery of modern times. There is no doubt whatever in his mind that the script was more archaic than that of the Nash papyrus. He went on to say he should prefer a date around 100 BC. What an absolutely incredible find and there can happily not be the slightest doubt in the world about the genuineness of the manuscript or manuscripts. Scrolls were taken to Beirut and placed in a bank there for safekeeping. And Samuel picks them up later in the year. And then in 1949 takes them to the States where they were to spend the next few years in a New York bank vault. And then later on they're announced. more history of what went down in the, in the, after the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in the caves. Now I guess they found more caves with more scrolls in it.
you just scroll here in the site designated K3 a research team found two scrolls or rather two fragments of the same scroll of rolled copper the writings on it had been punched into the metal oxidization had rendered the metal too brittle to be unrolled before it could be read the scrolls would have to be sliced open in a laboratory laboratory three and a half years would have passed before the Jordanian authorities allowed this to be done when they at last consented the cutting was performed in Manchester England under the auspices of John Allegro a member of DeVoe's team the first segment of the scroll was finished in some uh, 1955 the 2nd of January 1956 the scroll proved to be an inventory of treasure a compilation of or listing of gold silver ritual vessels and other scrolls apparently at the commencement of the Roman invasion this treasure had been divided into a number of secret caches or caches and a copper scroll as it came to be known detailed the content and whereabouts of each such case cache cache thus for example item 7 in the cavity of the old house of tribute in the platform of the chain 65 bars of gold According to researchers, the total hoard water amounts to some 65 tons of silver and perhaps 26 of gold. To this day, there are some arguments as to whether the treasure ever in fact existed. Most scholars, however, are prepared to accept that it did and that the scroll comprises an accurate inventory of the Temple of Jerusalem. Unfortunately, the locations indicated by the scroll have been rendered meaningless by time change in the course of two millennia, and nothing of the treasure has ever been found. A number of people certainly have searched for it. In September 1952, six months after the official survey, they surfaced a new source of scrolls. It proved to be a cave within some 50 feet of the actual ruins of Qumran, which the Vaux and Harding had excavated in 1951. Here at the site demarcated K4, the largest discovery of all was made again predictably by the Bedouin some years would be required to piece the material together by 1959 however most of the fragments had been organised the work was conducted in a large room which came to be known as the Scrollery at the Rockefeller Museum and some history on that some information on that International team, chapter two. After interviewing DeVoe, David Price Jones stated that he found him an in, irascible in, brute, slightly potty too. He's a bit of a nut. According to Magan Broshi, currently director of the Israeli Shrine of the Book, DeVoe was a rabid anti-Semite and a rabid anti-Israeli, but was the best partner one could ask for. More information on the international team. More discoveries. The scandal of the scrolls.
Ironically enough, it was not a biblical scholar, not an expert in the field, but an outsider who first detected something suspect in the international team's position. The outsider was a distinguished American literary and cultural critic, Edmund Wilson, whom most university students in Britain and the States will have encountered through his work in fields far removed from Qumran and first century Palestine. He is known for his own fiction, for I thought of Daisy, and particularly memoirs of Kate Kelney. He is known as the author of Axel's Castle, an original and pioneering study of the influence of French symbolism on 20th century literature. He is known for To the Finland Station, an account of Lenin's machinations and the Bolshevik hijacking of the Russian Revolution, and he is known for the grotesque, highly publicised literary feud he participated with his former friend Vladimir Nabokov by presuming to challenge in Nabokov's translation of Pushkin's Evgeny Onegin. As his controversy with Nabokov demonstrated, Wilson had no compunction about venturing into waters beyond his official officially acknowledged expertise, but perhaps it was just such recklessness that Qumran research required the perspective, perspective of an outsider, a man capable of establishing, establishing some kind of overview. In any case, Wilson in 1955 wrote a lengthy article for the New Yorker on the Dead Sea Scrolls, an article which for the first time made the scrolls a household phrase and generated interest in them from the general public. And then he expands his article. Wilson stressed how much the scrolls had in common with both rabbinical Judaism as it was emerging during the first century AD and with the earliest forms of Christianity and he noted a marked inhibition on the part of both Judaic and Christian oriented scholars to make the often obvious connections. One would like to see that these problems one would like to see these problems discussed, and in the meantime one cannot but ask oneself whether the scholars who have been working on scrolls, so many of whom have taken Christian orders, who have been trained in a rabbinical tradition, may not have been somewhat inhibited in dealing with such questions as these by their various religious commitments. One feels a certain nervousness, a reluctance to take hold of the subject and to place it in historical perspective. In accordance with scholarly de decorum, Wilson is, of course, being tactful, couching a fairly serious charge in the most diplomatic of language. He himself had no compunction about taking hold of the subject and placing it in a historical perspective. If, if in any case we look now at Jesus in the perspective supplied by the scrolls, we can trace a new continu continuity, at last get some sense of the drama that culminated in Christianity. The monastery of Qumran is perhaps more than Bethlehem or Nazareth, the cradle of Christianity. It is, it is, alas, a characteristic and typical of biblical scholarship, and particularly of scholarship associated with the scrolls, that such a connection shall be made not by the experts in the field, but by an astute and informed observer. For it was Wilson who gave precise and succinct expression to the very issues the international team endeavouring so diligently to avoid. These imputations about the bias of most biblical scholars were echoed to us personally, or to them personally, the authors, by Philip Davies, Professor of Biblical Studies at the University of Sheffield and author of two books on the Qumran material. As Professor Davies pointed out, most scholars working with the scrolls were, and for that matter, still are Christian-oriented, with a background primarily in the New Testament. He knew a number, he said, whose research sometimes conflicted painfully with their most passionately held personal beliefs and questioned whether objectivity, objectivity in such cases was really possible. Professor Davies stressed the perennial confusion of theology with history. All too often, he said, the New Testament is taught not just as a former, but also as a latter, as a literal and accurate account of first century events. And if one takes the New Testament, the Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles as incon incontrovertible historical fact, it is impossible to do scholarly justice to the scrolls. Christian doctrine, in effect, in effect dictates the agenda. Is that like that Christian doctrine dictates the end? 
results, the meanings, etc., the interpretation. Because Edmund Wilson was an outsider, the international team could get away with adopting towards him an attitude of patronizing condescension. I'd give him a hard time. Uh, Look down upon him. He was too distinguished to be insulted or abused, but he could well he could be ignored or dismissed superciliously as an inter- intelligent and well-intentioned amateur who simply did not understand the complexities and subtleties of the issues involved, and who, in his alleged naivety, might make rash statements. It was thus that many scholars were intimidated against saying what they actually believed. Academic reputations are fragile things, and only the most audacious or secure individuals could afford to incur the risk involved. The risk of being discredited or being isolated by a concerted critical barrage from adherence of this consensus. The scrolls are a... Is that a fief? Shima Yahu Tamwan himself, a prominent Israeli professor in the field, observed and the scholars who monopolised him were in effect a cabal. Andre Dupont Sommer, professor of Semitic language and civilization at the Sorbonne, had presented a public paper which caused a sensation. He addressed himself to one of the Qumran texts recently translated. He des- described, he explained to his audience, a self styled sect of the New Covenant, whose leader, known as the Teacher of Righteousness, was held to be a Messiah, was persecuted, tortured, and martyred. The teachers, followers believed the end of the world to be imminent and only those with faith in him would be saved and albeit cautiously the point Somna did not shrink from drawing the obvious conclusion that the teacher of righteousness was in many ways the exact prototype of Jesus these, assu- these assertions provoked a school of controversy and protest Jesus' uniqueness and originality were held to be under attack in the Catholic establishment, especially in France and the States, began to unleash its critical artillery. Dupont Sommer himself was somewhat shaken by the reaction and in subsequent statements sought shelter behind more circumspect phraseology. Anyone who might have been inclined to support him was also, for a time, obliged to... He's all the photos the Arabs etc those involved in the discoveries a portion of one of the scrolls Haba Kuk commentary which tells of a battle between the leader of the Dead Sea community and two opponents the liar and the wicked priest yeah so much been cut off unfortunately Examples of uh, skull fragments brought from the Bedouin after the identification and arrangement. Qumran, Qumran excavations. The unopened copper skull found broken into two sections in Cave 3 in 1952. He made some people, these people are threatened, bullied, duck for cover. Yet the seed of doubt had been planted and was eventually to bear fruit. From the standpoint of Christian theological tradition, that fruit was to be particularly poisonous when it burgeoned amidst the international teams themselves, team themselves, in the very precincts of the Rockefeller Museum scrollery in that particular room. It talks about John Marco Allegro, the most spontaneous, the most independent-minded, 
the most resistant to suppression of material. Okay, he's ex Navy, Royal Navy. Entered Man Manchester University as an undergraduate studying logic, Greek, and Hebrew. He later he transferred to the honors course in Semitic studies. He also developed an interest in philology, the study of the origins of language, its underlying structure and development, bringing his philological expertise to bear on biblical texts. He quickly became convinced that scripture could not be taken at face value and proclaimed himself an agnostic. And he graduated with a BA, etc., etc. Trying to get to where it actually talks about the actually points out what the scrolls say. Seems to be a lot of banter and a lot of different things that happen between the international team, etc.